I would like to start by thanking our sponsor, IBM, for being in space, and I would especially like to thank Henry, without whom we could not have this meeting. Yay! I'd like to thank Pearson, Francis Cole, Mark Taub, and Heather Fox, who sent us three books that we just gave away. You deal with the book is, you need to review it on Amazon.com after you read it. Whether you like it or not, uh, although they would probably prefer that if you didn't like it, you didn't have much to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> but they're actually very popular, and they're all pretty good books, and they're free. All you have to do is review it. Uh, our Python workshop meets every other Tuesday at the Hudson Library. We met last night. I believe it was probably our biggest meeting ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 11 yeah. people. Yeah, um, it was interesting. We, uh, I came here. I came a little bit late, and uh, quite a few of the people who were there were, are now here today. But uh, we had 11 people. We were discussing Python, and one particularly David, one of, one of David's projects, um, using uh, a uh, library called Pygame to do vi some very visual things, and um, we uh, had a lot of good time. So uh, very More interesting. Stuff. Here. <laughs> our next meeting is next. Me our next meeting is in two weeks from yesterday. Same place, Leroy Street uh, Hudson Library, and uh, come on by. We'll, we'll put another table up. And we have uh, the uh, mailing list too, right? Well, we have yeah. a mailing list for that group, uh, which is listed on our mailing list page. We have RSS feeds for all of the lists now, so we're all Web 2.0 Um the, the next meeting is July 8th, and it'll be two weeks after that again. And you do not strictly need a notebook. In fact, David doesn't have one. Um, it's a little easier to follow what you do. <laughs> Uh, Someone would like to buy that. Yeah. Yeah. I will not. He's fine. He's fine. He can't get paid for it. Uh, so we do have a various mailing list. We have a low volume dialogue announce list where you will get mostly our announcements and other announcements from other groups in the area. Uh, we have the dialogue talk discussion group. We have the dialogue Python workshop group. Uh, and we have a social list where you can discuss things that are non-technical without having other people yell at you about it. <laughs> uh, we also have an active IRC channel on Freenode at the uh, Pound Nylog. Uh, does anyone have any announcements to make? I have one announcement. Okay. All right, um, I have one announcement to make. Um, how many people here are on the um, business and professional group LinkedIn? We actually have. Yes, you are. Yeah, you got a very good showing of people on LinkedIn. I would like to announce that recently I did create a New York Linux user group on LinkedIn. So we do have a group for everyone who is a member of Nylog. Come on down, I am the manager of the group. And just come in, you know, drop me a line and say, I'd like to join the group, and I'll just, you know, I'll add you. And yeah. so far we have 16 members on the group. Wow. So any, any professionals that want to join Nylog, feel free to. Could you elaborate more on what the group is all about? Um, it, the group is on LinkedIn, and it's just basically for all of us nine loggers to keep in contact. And we can, you know, there, it's um, LinkedIn is basically a site for business and professionals to join together and you know recommend each other and to talk about projects they work on, where they're working, and their skills. It's basically like you know an online resume. And you know, there's a, you know there's already like I said 16 members on the nine group. And anybody who wants to join, feel free to. Just drop me a line and I'll add you to the list. <laughs> No, I'm not involved with a group of people, but I am a member of Free Open Source Society. You know, Free Open Source Software and LinkedIn as well. Do they have anything going on? No, it's basically all the Free Open Source people going together. And, you know, basically that's it. It's like professional contacts for everyone. Anyone else? Yeah. Sure. Uh, two things. One, July 10th. The Deluge group, that's desktop Linux users group for end users, will meet 
as in NYPC offices uh, on the, in the New Yorker Hotel, that's between 34th and 35th on 8th Avenue, uh, room 550, I believe. Um, the topic this month, I think, is going to be on uh, GIMP and or other uh, open source uh, graphic programs of various kinds, viewers and other things like Wendview, et cetera. Um, to check my webpage, which have to, I grant I have to update. It hasn't updated for a while. I want to update it. But to check that for any other specifics about the meeting. Uh, it starts at 6.30. Uh, and one other thing on a personal note, I haven't got a, a, I've, I've got this issue with, um, I'm virtualizing a Windows instance with SQL Server working, and I'm having some networking issues, and I'm hoping that I can get some help from somebody, so if anyone is interested in helping with, uh, give me some advice on that, on that uh, wait till after the meeting, we can talk about it offline. You okay? might want to mention specifically what it's about, though, since it's one of the bridging things. It's pretty rough topic. Well, it's, yeah, it's a, well, okay, it's, it's a, uh, the, the virtual, the virtual instance has to be hosting a server, essentially, for SQL Server, so someone can attach to the, to ODBC, the uh, SQL Server and, um, the data. Okay, so. Like it work. Uh, it just doesn't seem to. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and I, I can't seem <laughs> to get sample working. Uh, Telnet does seem to communicate back and forth, but, even so, even with um, the TCP IP and main pipe set up under, under the uh, SQL server, it just seems to be communicating, and neither the Samba. So uh, I'd like to know what it is I'm doing wrong. So if anyone can help out with that, I'd like to, any information given would be helpful. Anyone else? Does anyone know enough about Hope to say something about it? <coughs> hope. hope. All by the ways that I'm going. <laughs> okay. Hope is. Uh, Hope is from the 2600. It's um, hackers, people who want to, you know, learn. Um, not necessarily black, not necessarily white hat hackers. Just people who want to, you know, look right at hacks. how, yeah, look at how things how things work, even if you're maybe not supposed to know. And uh, they're getting together. It's called the Last Hope, and the Hotel Pennsylvania might get. Um, uh, Demolished, which is the venue, so they're not sure if there's going to be another one. So uh, it's um, 18, 18 through, yeah, the 18 through the what? 20th. Um, That's next uh, one. Right? Yeah, it's I don't know, just look up the last hope. Um, and uh, there's going to be there's going to be cool stuff. There's going to be like uh, they have these tags, these Wi-Fi tags that yeah. they're going to they're going to track and see what you know see what you can do with RFID. Um, you yeah, know. Like I said the first 15 Star Trek, people right? handing out RFID tags. What's that? First 1500 people that get a yeah. conference badge when you get there are going to have the RFID tag on their. On their they're having something tag. like a hacker space, like they're they're showing off what different people do in different places and how they set up their spaces. It's going to be different people teaching different things. So registration is I think seventy five dollars for the weekend. Yes. So, uh, so uh, are there going to be uh, guys in like like black suits? There is government people that go there, definitely, absolutely. Yeah, there's like about half of them that, that go there are are from the government, from the so yeah, I, I, do I, do know that, I, I do know that, that, that Will Smith and, and, and Tommy Lee Jones will not be there. Oh, Stan, boy. So much for that. So much for that. Uh, anyone else? Any other announcements? <laughs> That doesn't mean agent, agent, the other, other agents, the single letters won't be there, but that's another issue. Agent Z. 99? 99. <laughs> <laughs> single digit. Single digit. <laughs> that's, that's kept smart. 99 is there, 86 might also be there, and you'd have a problem. <laughs> Without further ado, I would like to welcome Mark Tolliver from Palomita on application security for open source software. Okay, um, I don't know if you guys read it, it was a, a, a Times piece this morning talking about uh, where all the tech guys are these days. So I'm from Silicon Valley, the uh, third most populous tech area in the United States. And I'm happy to be here at number one. One of the, fir one of the first two. Yeah, Washington, New York number one, Washington DC number two, Silicon Valley number three. Oh, so really? I was, uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm surprised. Yeah, yeah. 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 surprised. Yeah. Yeah. I thought we were always to Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah, just. Yeah, yeah, it was like, what were some of the numbers? It's like 300 and some odd thousand people uh, in New York, 276,000, something like that in Washington, and less than that in Silicon Valley. Wow. 
Wow. So, uh, yeah, surprising. So, wow. here I am in the tech capital of the United States, I guess, huh? Yeah. 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 Capital yeah. Yeah, and entertainment. Mm -hmm. That's right. Subway, whatever. There you go. Uh, so, listen, I will uh, tee things up with a few comments. It's, it's a little strange for me to be uh, speaking exactly to this group, because you know, you actually are one of the few groups that I can speak to that knows exactly what I'm going to say yeah. and why I'm going to say it. That's right. What I wind up usually doing is talking to, to, to guys who have no idea what I'm talking about. You mean suits? Excuse me, I, I use that as a uh, <laughs> term, but uh, point taken. Point taken. Point taken. Suits. 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 And anyway, we have a bunch of gorgeous men, so I don't know what to do, you know? Well, I'm not jumping in there. <laughs> Smart man. Yeah. So, so let me. Sorry. Wait. Yeah, I, I, I serve you like I just landed from some other planet. Right? I mean, like, like, real, like suits, you know. Suits. Yeah, would be the, uh, you did, it was from Mars to Fornia. Just tell me you came from Mars to we'll the planet about the landers we were sending. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, ice caps. Right. So, so, uh, so I'll start with a, a little story about how this our company kind of got going. Years ago, years ago, I spent uh, quite a long time at Sun, and at one point there, uh, did a deal in which uh, Sun. Uh, it was it was a complex thing, and I won't I won't try to unravel it for you. But the net of it is Sun ended up buying all the software from Netscape. And out of that deal, we created this thing called iPlanet. I don't know if you guys ever yeah, ran into that uh, brand in those years. I might have heard of it. Yeah, heard of it. yeah. in those yeah, years. It was, a, it was a strange and wonderful deal um, having to do with AOL and Netscape and all sorts yeah. of things. But at the end of the day, I ended up being responsible for that. And one of the big questions sort of way in the back office on that was, I wonder what we actually got from Netscape in terms of these tens of millions of lines of code. What, what, what did we actually get? In those days, uh, everybody was, uh, was was thinking, well, at some point in time, we might want to take that code and post it as a, as a free download. We might want to do all sorts of other things. Can't do, uh, do we actually own it? So we went to the Netscape guys. This was before the, the actual deal to buy it closed. This was a dot-com deal, so it was outrageously expensive. But, um, but it was funny money, So, but we did it anyway. And, and we said to the Netscape guys, anybody know uh, what the, what's, what's in there, where, where it all came from in the code. And, and they looked back at us, like again, like we were from Mars, and said, no, we don't have a clue. And uh, we went ahead, did the thing anyway, put a little contingency aside in case there was too much uh, weird in there, and set about, after it was done, going through that code, literally, line by line, to try and figure out what was in there. And it was, it was amazing. It was my first sort of exposure to the extent to which um, code is shared, borrowed, appropriated, otherwise moved around to form, you know, products that we all know about. It was also my first introduction to open source licensing and all that sort of world. But you know, every copyright in the world was in there. You mean besides Windows, this is the first time? Yeah. Well, I, know, I don't know about you. I've never looked inside Windows. Uh, not even good. during the 2000 source code leak. No, not even during the 2000 source code. Uh, the Franken code. Uh. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and uh, yeah, who knows what you would find in there. But we do know when we looked at the Netscape code that it was shot through with, with copyrights for everybody you can imagine, with all sorts of open source. Fast forward, it took us three years to sort of get our arms around it. You know, going through it, calling guys in, what does, it, what does that mean? Sort of, you know, we tried our best in those days to straighten it out. If, if, there, was a, if there was some code from some commercial company in there and the license uh, didn't allow us to use it, we went out and negotiated a new license and tried to be good guys about it. But it was my first notion for three years of, uh, of work, holy cow, this is really a tough thing to figure out. Uh, what, you know, after the fact, what's in a chunk of code? And uh, so I didn't think much about it. I just sat in the meetings going, can't you guys hurry this up? Don't you have some tools? And they said, oh, yeah, we have a really great tool to do this. And I said, terrific. What is it? Crap. <laughs> and, and that was it in those days. That was all they had. So it took three years, very expensive proposition, finally sorted out. In the back of my mind was this notion that that's, uh, that's a really bad way to solve this problem. 
Uh, but I didn't think much about it. And then fast forward more, I, I uh, subsequently left Sun, was intending to play a lot of golf and maybe not much more, and then I ran across a couple of guys who were uh, actually two guys, one woman, who were starting a little company to address that problem. In other words, to address this question of how can we, after the fact, uh, uh, run software through a metal detector and find out what's in it. And uh, so I said, well, that, huh, that is exactly this problem I spent three years working on with, with, uh, with the Netscape code. So, so I jumped in. That's where Palomita got started. And the reason I say that it's, it's straight, I don't need really to talk to you guys about it, because you get, if, I mean, those of you that actually are doing uh, development in, in addition to your sys admin responsibilities and so forth, you get that today, um, code is comprised primarily of open source modules that are that are linked together with a, you know some some proprietary glue logic. And most people, you know, outside this room don't fully understand that unless they're living in a development organization. Uh, and so I'll give you a, I'll give you a stat here that, that I use, which which is uh, which is what's going on. Part of what we do, by the way, our our company builds a product, you know, the the, the metal detector, so to speak, to, to figure this out. And then the other side of the company, uh, we have a professional services group that. that jumps in when somebody shows up with their hair on fire and says, I don't want to buy your product, I don't want to install your product, I don't want to use your product, I just want somebody to look at this chunk of code and tell me if you know, I should go ahead with whatever I'm contemplating from the standpoint of, of buying it or acquiring it or whatever. <clears throat> so on that side of our world, the professional services side, we look at, I don't know, 100, 150 different um, uh, fully formed software projects every year for the purpose of telling somebody what they're made of. All right, so we get a pretty good, we got a pretty good sample of what's going on. And the one that, that we sort of made an example out of, and I can't tell you the company, because it's one you would recognize, it is a big commercial ISV, whose name you would all be familiar with. Their, their product is a big one, it's about, about 60 million lines of code. They brought it to us, they said, we would like you guys to sort it out, help us with this, and they had some reasons for that, which we don't need to get into, but they wanted to know. And so we said, sure, that's what we do. So the guys started to work. And part of what we do when we do to start this is it's sort of like we're sort of like a consulting firm in the sense that, you know, you, you know the joke for consulting firms, right? You know, if you're working with a consultant and, and you ask them what time it is, they will borrow your watch. <laughs> so, yeah. so, uh, so we sort of borrow their watch in that sense. We ask them to fill out a little form up front and say, I'm sorry for all of you guys that are consultants. So. <laughs> but yeah, we asked them up front to say, uh, why don't you declare the, the open source uh, components that you know about that are in this application, and we'll va validate for you along with other things that you switch out. So uh, they did that, and they said, we're pretty good at this, so we don't think you guys are going to have a lot to do, even though it's 60 million lines of code, because here they are, here's a list of 300 open source components that we use. So for the time we were done, just take a guess at the actual number of open source components in use. They, they knew they had 300. 1,200? Yeah, it was about 900. 900. Yeah. So they knew about a third of, wow. of what was actually in use. Uh, two thirds was basically unknown to them. What? Uh, what? Yeah. I mean, in any formal way. I mean, the developer that put it in, if he's still around, or she, knew about it. But, but uh, it was never really written down, or else it would have appeared on the list. So the point is, uh, you know, the notion is undocumented. And yeah, question back here. Uh, what sort of components were they? Can you give us? Oh yeah, I mean they were the, they were the they ranged from from well known things, you know, uh, JWAS or something, down into you know Zlib and Hibernate and Curl and you so know all libraries, the, libraries, 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 yeah, shared components, libraries, all these sorts of things that that are widely used, but typically not widely written down. Yeah. Uh, were there any? Uh, non-open source components they weren't, they weren't aware of in the, in the yeah. code. There's always some of that, too. I mean, you, know, you go into the shared library uh, directory and, yeah, there's always some of that. In fact, uh, what, we will what we will tell people when, when, when our uh, professional services team takes a look is we will guarantee surprises. Always, always, <laughs> always. Um, and uh, so, so anyway, this is, this is what's going on, is, is we find somewhere between uh, 3x and 5x of what people are aware of. Yeah. You just described that. How is it that, that I'm linking to code that I don't know about? I'm you know about it. You know about it. You leave ah. the company and your boss doesn't know about it. Yeah, ah. that's the notion. Ah, yeah, exactly right. Is the idea that you also don't know what the guy is known by? Or the developer who documents what he did? That's precise. He may have documented it in the, in the comments or something like that in the code, but, mm -hmm. but 
in terms of any formal notion that says, on, on this day, I decided to use curl version 7.1.1 in this application, doesn't exist. Okay. Oh, oh, the actual is there any tools to actually document something like that for the future? <laughs> it's over. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, this is a sales pitch in case you have yeah. like, <laughs> 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 so you're saying you haven't really broken into that yet. You mean like oh, automated document writer? Something like that? Or? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Well, so, so let me just, okay, just pause for a second. Um, what we do for a living is we, we built a product that scans code for the purpose of identifying uh, modules. When you said scan, I'm talking about when you're developing the we, code yourself yeah. to, to document. Yeah, that. and we have then decided that people want what you described okay. as well. Right. And we have added that in. Oh, so okay. it does both. Okay. So it's a, there's a documentation front end that, that allows people to say, on oh, this date, I'm going to put this in. And then, and, and, right. and then a little workflow that, that says, this is OK, you can do it, or no, you can't. because. And even a little bit more of, if you're going to use it, you should get it from our directory of known open source projects that we have vetted as opposed to getting it from the wild and downloading it using it. So, so yes, there's that front end, plus there's the, the scanning back end where, where the product looks around and says, aha, look what we find. Right, and if you get it from your thing, you know what you get. You know? Yeah, if you get it from, from right. a known repository, known directory of right. vetted code, right. then uh, you know what you got. Right. Exactly, exactly. I see it. Okay. So, uh, so back to this example then, the, the, the point that we make to people is, and, and very clearly is, look, open source is a wonderful thing. I mean, for all the reasons that, that you're, you're quite familiar with, uh, we use it. We have, we have 123 different components that we use in, in, the, in the construction of our box, but you know, we are very careful to write them down <laughs> and uh, you know, stick them on our web page and do all that sort of stuff. But most people don't. And, and so, you know, when I meet with people, um, like at lunch uh, today with a guy from, a, from the insurance company, a security officer. I said it's quite lucky. He says, well, we have a policy. We, have, we don't use open source software in our development. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a terrific policy. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Did you make him a bet that, uh, that, that it made the Well, you know, what I told him is I said, you don't believe that, right? He said, no. <laughs> that's, that's, that's funny. Like, that's that's funny. Like, that's like, as I was going to lie and saying, put the cookie jar out. No, I didn't take the cookie out of it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah exactly I right. I swear I've never seen that cookie in my life. Yeah, I don't know where that, <laughs> I don't know where that cookie came from. Totally <laughs> yeah, so, so the point we make to this guy is, look, uh, let's say, just hypothetically, that uh, people aren't 100% complying with your no open source policy, okay? I would bet that the last mission critical app that your insurance company put together is probably, maybe it's on the low side, maybe it's only 40% comprised of open source code on a lines of code basis instead of the 50 to 60 that we normally see. I said, and it's even more likely, since you have no procedures at all, that it's all undocumented in any formal way. So basically, as a security guy who's trying to keep our insurance records, you know, secure, 40% of the code that you're running is unknown to you. Where did it come from? Who put it in? What's it do? Et cetera, et cetera. And I guess the point I make is, it, 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 that I do make when I, when I have these meetings with people, is that's the proposition that we are uh, making to the world today, is that, look, open source is a wonderful thing. Undocumented code is a bad thing. Uh, and so if you're going to build things out of open source, which is a great way to do it, uh, at a bare minimum, minimum, you should document what's in there. And that's what we can help with both from the, you know, use our product on the front end, use our product on the back end thing. Further, what we do, once we figure out what you've got, we associate with a couple of things. Number one, uh, and this makes lawyers very happy, we, which is that what we did in the Netscape days, is we associate with what license terms are associated with the open source thing that you've got. You know, there's GPL and about 100 other different licenses, all the way to the beer license, you know, if you ever meet me in the <laughs> yeah, code. Well, yeah, true, right. yeah. Yeah. It's in our library, buy me a beer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Freezing beer. Yeah. That was a whole thing. If you like Slackware, buy me a beer. Buy me a beer. Yeah. That's a GPL beer, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so, yeah, so the first thing we, that's right, so the first thing we do, which actually lawyers in tech firms uh, actually like quite a bit, is we'll go through and, and notify you with respect to, you know, you got these components under these licensing terms, and if you want to set up a whitelist, blacklist that says, hey, for what we're doing, we better not use this list of licenses because we're 
going to infringe them because of the way we use the software, great. We can tell you that before you go off and do it. Uh, the other thing we do is associate with known and published vulnerabilities. You know, so there are lots of lists. Out. And, you know, the open source world is very good about finding and fixing. You know, it's, it's one of the great things about open source code is there's a lot of eyes on it, a lot of finding and fixing. Going. What's the Debian uh, so SSL? This is the this is the poster child right now. Is is the Debian uh, uh, Open SSL thing? You all well, know about it that, right? in your library? Yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. Well, <laughs> the ability to detect Open SSL is, and then we associate it with this new vulnerability. What was? This is just an example for in case you didn't see this thing. Um, what happened is, is somebody changed one line of code. And so, the guy told me he ran it. What did he say the other day? He ran it through a, 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 the, the uh, Purify Analyzer or something like that. So this is bad. Or okay. Was that it? Yeah. Anyway, took one line of code out, and all of a sudden, the, the universe of, uh, of public key, private key pairs went from you know whatever it is, trillions to four. <laughs> so so for that distro. All you needed to know was one of four uh, public key, private key pairs and you're in. And so that's an example of a vulnerability that was, they, and they stopped the distribution for a week, they, they put their heads down, they fixed it, all is well. Uh, but there's an example of, of uh, you know, a very important vulnerability. Yeah. And look, most guys are going to know if they've got this particular, if they're using Debian distro, but what about Zlib? And in fact, that's another interesting story to tell. Oh. Zlib, you've heard of that, the compression decompression uh, library. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so one of the guys in our professional services group late last year got a new laptop and just for sport said, I wonder how many instances of Zlib I can find in the program files. <laughs> so what do you think? What do you think that, in, you know, because this is a nice new laptop with all fresh crapware and everything. So how many do you think? Hundreds. Hundreds. Exactly right. 236. Wow. Instances of Zlib. And they're all, were they all pointing to the shared library, or did it link statically, or? It was a mix, uh -huh. you know, it was a mix. Um, so I went to the Zlib page, just, just for fun, after I saw that, just to, just to read up on the thing, and right there on the front, it says, uh, dated July something, 2005. We are today releasing Zlib 1.2.3. All known vulnerabilities have been addressed and fixed. People who uh, use Zlib prior to this, in other words, previous versions, must upgrade because all versions prior to 1.2.3 are vulnerable to buffer overflow and therefore unpredictable behavior. So please upgrade. This was at the time, two and a half years after he got his laptop, or before he got his laptop. So two and a half years, the message had been out there, we found it, we fixed it, everything's cool. So the obvious question, what percentage of those 236 were at the fixed level, 1.2.3, and what percent were before? So answer, 31% were at the current rev level, 69% were sitting in there two and a half years later uh, at vulnerable levels, at, at version wow. levels that were vulnerable. Gosh. Look, are you surprised really? No, no. absolutely not. You Somebody put it in, it works. You don't know what's there, why would you fix it? Why would you fix it? Think yeah. So this is, this is, the, this is the, the other notion we have is this stuff goes in, there's no formal record of it, uh, and nobody is pushing patches or upgrades or even notifications uh, about things that are embedded in the code. So that's another service that, that, that we do is say, hey, look, we inventory the code, you got Zlib, you know, 69% of the in instances are at an in insecure, all you got to do is, is upgrade 1.2.3 and you're good. This laptop that you're describing, this is a, a Windows install? Yeah, Windows, Windows Sony, file. <laughs> uh, without any particular software installed on it or? Crapware. Crapware. The stuff that usually comes on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah the stuff that comes on it. Yeah, yeah, it the wasn't, wasn't so loaded up with. You know. So they're scanning the binaries on this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's a, so your, your software works with binaries or code? Or yeah, code, binaries, you know, Java namespaces yeah. kind of in the middle. We do that, you know, plus just, you know, very specialized string searches, copyrights, and URLs, and emails, and stuff. So we drag a whole bunch of nets through for the purposes of, of figuring this out. By the way, just Back to my Netscape story for a second. We, I sort of, I asked our, our team on this, and, and I said, uh, how long do you think it would take to do this project that took us three years, uh, knowing what we know today? And they said, well, if we did it, our, our team being experts using our tool, they said, take us somewhere between three, two and four weeks to, to do what took us three years in those days. 
So, um, you know, just gosh, you, you focus on it, you build a good career, you move faster. So that's, that's the net of that. So the point of, 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 of my uh, talk and why, I, why it's kind of strange to be talking to all of you, because you, you understand that open source is widely used. It's a good thing. It goes in as Legos. It's not just Linux. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of components, the names of which most people have, have never heard of. Uh, comprising 50 to 60 percent of a modern application and generally speaking there is no mechanism for knowing it's there or addressing any uh, upgrade security vulnerability problems as you might address those that come with the uh, commercial code because the vendor is trying to push that sort of information to you so we just are one of these firms that kind of pops up in response to a major you know wave that sweeps over the industry in this case the wave being the use of open source code and always somebody pops up and says, you know, I had to do this thing manually and it really uh, it killed me. So I'm going to go write a great tool to help. And out of that, you know, spring businesses of the type that, that we have. So, yeah. Um, I just wanted to back a little bit. Um, so we were talking about commercial, you know, like commercial software using open source libraries and um, the crapware, you know, yeah. the crapware vulnerability. Do you remember the uh, 2005 Sony BMG copyright? The root thing? Yeah, 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 the root thing. Do you remember? Um, it was uh, discovered that that, um, that rootkit was actually using uh, code from the Lane libraries. Yes. The Lane mm -hmm. uh, that was under um, LGPL. Yeah, in fact, and somebody had a double. A lot of hot water they got traffic. a double hit on that. Number one, they had a rootkit. Number two, they were infringing an LGPL library. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh, there was a second one yeah. involving Sony. Um, I don't remember the exact code. It was an arc li It was like a DARC library, I believe. But they're one of the PlayStation 2 games, I thought, actually was um, using GPL code. In it well, for data for data streaming, yeah, and it was revealed, and they got into hot water for that. Well, it's, a, it's actually a group, a group, a guy, and, and, and supporters in Germany called gplviolations.org. Yeah, uh -huh. I don't know if you've ever run into that. I've run into that. I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they focus on it. They focus on devices, and then they go in and, and try to look at the code inside, you know, routers and hubs and switches Busy and the devices. Busy boxes. Yeah. 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 Busy that's one. Yeah. The other one manufacturer of Walton DVD player. Right. Oh, DVD player? Apparently, this box is a nice question of utilities. Exactly. Of, of, uh, embedded utilities, yeah. Exactly. It's so perfect. He felt it's a perfect little thing to do anything else. Yeah. And Bruce, I've had last name, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's all nicely packaged. You just take the whole thing and you got most of the utilities you'd ever want for a, an embedded. Yeah, like a copy, like a tiny copy of that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And the guy is, it's a GPL thing, and pretty much, you know, if you want to find a GPL infringement, pretty much every device out there uses BusyBox, and most of them don't know it, and you know. I think um, Arcos was another company that got um, they got in trouble for that because they used um, a Linux based uh, code for their, for their four, for players, the yeah. four or five mm -hmm. um, PMPs mm -hmm. and they were forced to release all the code because it was GPL code in you know in the devices so they had to release the whole thing. Yeah. Well, there's a there's a big story in, in Silicon Valley about Cisco and one of the Linksys uh, routers, same deal. Right. Yeah. 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 Identify any um, infringed uh, GPL code by uh, some of the major software players. We could you? Let's that? let's put it this way: we certainly could. In this particular case, the story I told, the guy just went and said, "Let's let's do a Zlib analysis," and so we focus on that because he knew we get, it was a it was he was going to find hundreds. So so that's all we did in that case, but. But sure, we, you know, we, we drag our nets through and we will pop up the information that shows, you know, evidence of 
licenses and, and copyrights and everything else, and the chances are high. Did you ever run Vista's new networking code through? Uh, I didn't want to specify that. I think that followed BSD code, didn't it? Yeah, well, the BSD oh. IP stack was originally BSD, but I think they modified that. Really. Well, actually, my bigger question was if we ever ran Microsoft products, would we find, and what would we find? Yeah. <coughs> you know. <Crap. laughs> um, I know, I can tell you that. That, that company is intensely concerned that they are on the right side of IT issues because they're the ultimate deep pocket target. <laughs> what I also know is that that attention primarily goes sort of, the analogy would be sort of a firewall. In other words, any company that they buy, any code that comes in from outside sources and all that stuff is intensely analyzed for this sort of thing. What I don't know is the extent to which they have gone in and analyzed their legacy OS and apps and all that sort of stuff. I think they're, I, I just don't know about that. But I can tell you that the, 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 as they bring new code in, my gosh, I have never seen an organization more intensely focused on making sure they know exactly what's coming into that company and they will they will blow acquisitions away. Focused or paranoid? Paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> well, and rightly so. Yeah. 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 Uh, the Windows 95 C V races over and then one can't servers. Well that's that's also that's a fact, yeah. On, on the Windows ninety five C D there's a, there's an open source utility. I found this is years ago already. And I mean, actually, they actually included the license and the source code and everything. I think at that point in time, they were probably the largest open source software distributor in the world. Do you know who the largest open source software distributor in the world is? Right now, it's Apple. 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 Yeah. Apple. 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 It's so well developed. Assuming the person who turns on his Mac knows enough to, to turn on the root of the power. Because yeah. Apple prefers you don't do that for good reason. You can get an object from the ad page and build your own OSS kernel. Providing it work the first time around was never a good thing. Yeah. Well, there are, there are prezos in Black Hat on how to hack OS X, and, and they, they, the, end, the way they talk about hacking OS X is going into the open source components. In fact, you know how they got into the iPhone? Lipkiff. Wow. So it was, it was yeah. Yeah, boom. You know, he's got, they just know where you talk about, you know, uh, you know, white or black hat. I mean, one of the places people go is, is to the exploitable open source components. Did you know, TIFF or LibTIFF or whatever is, a, is clearly exploitable. You just go there and, huh? And <coughs> Apple is famous for being back on the use of all the open source stuff. The, the Black Hat conference slides which I have read, just go, you know, like long lists to say, here's, here's what they use, and they're like, this one's four reds back, this one's three reds, you know, start there, start there, start there, start there. So far as I understand, one of the easy, one of the ways that I've seen for the consoles to get hacked is to save games. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the Nintendo Wii had that, but um, their most recent firmware just finally cut that off. Because right. it was a Zelda save game. Yeah. 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 So, so, well, so they're to the Microsoft uh, console was doing right. save. Same thing. Same thing. Isn't that the last name of the Wii product? Is this one the problem? Maybe it's a couple of them. Yeah. 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 And the voice only goes to here. Did, did you guys help out with the determining the paternity of the Linux kernel and the SEO debacle? You know, we did not, and that was by choice. What was the yeah. question? Yeah. Yeah. They, they asked if we were used our radar gun on the scope deal back then, and uh, the answer was no. And I, I, right when I joined the company, I said, you know, we don't, we don't need to be. You know, messing, stirring the pot on this thing. Let, let, let Daryl shoot himself in the foot. Let uh, Daryl do what Daryl's going to do, and huh? and uh, and we'll just we'll stay out of it. Now we have, interestingly enough, one of the one of the places we have been used is where um, it is, you know, it's vaguely analogous, I guess, is <clears throat> remember the case with uh, 
who was it? It was somebody that had had a license to uh, SQL Server. Right? Was it Sybase or something? I forget. Oh, well, no, it's the other way around. So Microsoft, Microsoft licensed that. Anyway, yeah. at one point we, we, uh, we got involved and we did it. And, and the deal was is once, I, I think it was, once there's less than 5% of the original code in there, then, then you are free to do what you will with it. So the question was, how much of the original code is left? And you know we didn't build our product to do that, but it was a it was a natural sort of secondary use, so we did that. And ran, you know, ran that. Microsoft continues to a big strainer. In this case, you are we are in back to both Sybase for obvious reasons and Oracle because more blatantly obvious. So, so what was the answer? Did uh, Microsoft, what, what percentage of SQL Server is, is it above the 95%? Well, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't propose to give that info away, but, but they, they were doing everything, uh, I mean, everybody was playing according to the rules that they had set up for themselves. So it's just the deal here. And, and, you know, look, uh, you know, I've watched Microsoft from, from all angles. I mean, it's, in fact, I did when I was at... When I was at Sun, one of the big uh, things I, I did was, was settle the Microsoft Sun uh, dispute over Java. You know, so I spent a long time, you know, living with the, the Microsoft guys in the settlement of that thing. And I, I will, look, I'll put in a, a modest little plug for these guys. When it comes to trying to do the right thing from the standpoint of, you know, intellectual property matters, uh, the company, at least in its current form, operating as it does today, in my opinion, is doing a very diligent and, and admirable job. That's my opinion. So, you know, you can piss me out of here, but I, and there, I think there were times when uh, that perhaps they didn't, but I will tell you in the current state of affairs, they are, we call it paranoid, call it diligent, call it whatever you want to call it, but they are they're very, very focused on this topic and trying to do, you know, a good thing. And they know if they don't, Somebody's going to just nail me to the wall and sue them for billions. So. That's why I, I don't think they're trying to do the good thing, just trying to do the prudent thing. The prudent yeah. thing, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the, that's, actually, that's the right word. Yeah. 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 Did you ever do the reverse and do something like React OS, which is rewriting the NT kernel? I mean, would you, yeah. be, would you be able to at least? But, yeah, but the answer is, all, you know, once, once you have uh, something of the nature that we have, which is, you know, our, I didn't even talk about the technology here, but, but it's, our fundamental patent is massive multi-pattern search, which really means that we have the massive multi-pattern search, which means that we can take um, code in this, in this case on, on one side, break it up into thousands and thousands, if not millions of discrete queries against an even larger set of, 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 of searchable elements over here, and uh, compare the results and finish in your lifetime. I mean, that's, that's, that's our secret sauce. So once you have that, the answer is we can compare anything to anything. In fact, we could, I, my wife's an English teacher, high school English teacher, I said we could do a hell of a job on, uh, on uh, plagiarism sure. studies, you know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, it's not our gig, so we don't. But, but <laughs> you that's you actually an online service, service that does that. I know, at turnitin.com. Maybe you service. could even do DNA searches. Or, well, one of my, in that little startup I mentioned, we built a massively parallel computer. The only, it had 16,384 processors, and the only thing it was good for was DNA searching. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, Drake Venture bought the first one. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. The most embarrassingly parallel, parallel application in the world, and we were great at it. <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> Couldn't run a spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have kind of a, a question. Uh, sort of an esoteric question, but uh, if A is patented and the business model of writing words is patented in software patents, what does it all really matter if you're always going to have somebody infringing on a patent? Well, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you what is personal opinion. And, you know, look, our company files for software patents. I believe software patents are, for the most part, superfluous and, and largely misused. They're, 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 what they are is business process patents. That's the that's the kind of the basis for a, a software patent. And frankly, I think software should be governed by copyright. In other words, you should not be able to steal someone's code verbatim and use it without their permission. But this notion of, of, of software patents, by and large, in my personal opinion, is is, is destructive. To software is essentially mathematical computations of formulas. Yeah. And formulas in and of themselves are not patentable. That's correct. Yeah. 
If you, on the other hand, write code right. that does a nice job of implementing that formula, mm-hmm. by definition, you are a copyright holder. You don't, have, like, you don't even have to do anything. It's like, the writing, it's like, it's like a, writing an original work of book. It's like, it's like going out, taking a picture of a tree. You are the copyright holder on that picture of a tree, whether you do anything or not. And I happen to believe that's, that is, is a model that would work great for mm-hmm. software. And all these companies accumulate thousands and thousands of software patents and, and throw them around. I mean, it's, 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 uh, I don't know. As far as I understand it, with patent law, if you infringe on one small piece of that patent, you're infringing on the whole patent. That's right. Yeah. Uh, unlike with copyright law, where if you infringe on one little piece, you're only infringing on that one that's little piece. That's also correct. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, in, 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 that. in the case with software patents, that's why I say the letter A, because the letter A is used in your code. In every piece of code, yeah, you can't be charged with infringement because you have an A in your code. Somebody else. I, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm exaggerating, I of course, so. but yeah. but you know, I mean, with the with the with the government landscape as it exists, does that present sort of like a like a, a situation where your company go, people kind of go, well, what does it really matter? That's that's what that's what I'm well, saying. Well, yeah, and, and that's a really good question, and, and I think it's it's one that will be debated in our world for a long time. What about your opinion on it? Yeah, and my opinion is that software patents today are, for the most part, meaningless other than as trading currency. And so what people do with software patents is they keep other people from suing them over their software patents. In other words, it's mutually assured destruction. Look, I have a thousand patents over here that I've applied for. You mess with me, and I will launch one of those against you. I can so it's, like a, it's like a traffic cop. If they want to stop you, they can find a reason. But it also you know, prevents smaller companies from getting involved in what large companies don't want them to get involved in. That's correct. It also puts a damper on innovation. some actions, innovation around smaller organizations that want to implement new and interesting ways of doing things. And that's why I personally, you know, we don't, we don't have anything to say that, as a product-wise about patents. I mean, patents is not something you can point a scanner at and, and come up with, right? But my personal opinion is that software would be Governed nicely through, through the use of copyright uh, laws, so you shouldn't be able to rip somebody's code off and, and use it right. as is, you know, verbatim. No, shouldn't be able to do that. To right. res- respect the rights of that author. But from the standpoint of, hey, I got a great idea of how to, you know, mm-hmm. populate a desktop metaphor or something like that. You know, I, I find I find the patent activity on that to be, you know, relatively meaningless. Now, look, we we. Write the software patents. We pay our lawyers. We do all that, as I'm sure most of you do it defensively, though. Yeah, but it's a defensive mechanism, exactly right. So if somebody comes after us for some reason, we can go, well, don't do that because we probably have one that reads on. on, on so. so basically, what you're saying is, though, that your your uh, your company is really mainly searching about open source components, not so much for the software patents, because it is really defensive, mm-hmm. and people. Yeah, you know, we can't. We can't tell you if a piece of code is, is, is infringing a patent. We have no mechanism, no way to do that. I wish we did. I mean, man, we'd be. We'd well, be, what you uh, have to do is have to have, a, have to have a database or a library of all the patents, um, plus all the cases against whatever patents there are, and then search against those yeah. to see if they do the comparison. But somebody would have to map the meta component of what, what the patent's saying versus what the code's doing. Not to say the two yeah, say, what is the code doing versus, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a human problem. Yeah. Well, and Microsoft tried to pull that stuff in the Linux community. Yes. Two hundred million patents being being infringed upon, and they said, "Show us the proof." And Microsoft just went, "Well, you're infringing." So well, it was a scope. Same thing. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they said, "Show us, show us the evidence, and we'll fix it." Well, we'll do it. 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 We'll do Please be here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm going to uh, I'll, I'll wrap up relatively quickly. What I wanted to do in, in this is a couple of things. Number one is bring to the forefront the notion of uh, of being mindful of software composition, right? As developers, as system administrators, as as, u- as users of systems, uh, I think we are entering a period of time, or have entered, frankly period of time where anybody who is, is developing code or using code, but developing particularly, 
Uh, it has an obligation to be mindful of what's in there. It's just, it's just our way of life in this era, because we are reusing other people's intellectual property left and right. That's a good thing. Um, but we must respect the rights of the authors in, in this regard. And so we, you know, the, the point I make is, as, as a group of people who are deeply involved in the open source world, my message to you is the right thing to be is mindful of the rights of authors and mindful of the content of the, of the uh, components that you use. Simple message, but, but true. Number two is that an organization that is attempting to do this does need to move to the point where there is some policy and process in place to write this stuff down. Pure and simple. Um, if your organization doesn't have one You're of suggesting those, documenting code? I'm suggesting <laughs> documenting, yeah. Uh, documenting, you know, there's, there's a, not commenting, but documenting. Yeah. Yeah, the, you, you know, the you shape know, of the You talk about metadata about code. Yes, metadata about code composition. What did we use to, com to compose this code? Uh, and if your organization isn't doing that, particularly if you're an organization of any size whatsoever, um, that you are exposing yourself to, to both, uh, you know, business risk on the, on the infringement side, as well as, as security risk, because, you know, these, these things are rolling, you'll have another OpenSSL or ZLib or whatever, or LibTIF, and you simply will not know about it. And then the third point would be that if you're of a size that, is, that makes it appropriate, there are organizations like ours under the umbrella of application security, which is a broad, broad, broad umbrella, but we're beginning to supply uh, tools, systems, processes, and so forth to do that. And we're seeing, you know, who buys our, 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 uh, our systems today? Everybody from, you know, Cisco uses it, that we have big banks that use it, small, actually some very small companies use it, interestingly enough, and it's sort of everybody uh, in between. The, the other point, sort of sub-point, just one moment, would be that if you're in an organization and you're actually involved in acquiring uh, other software companies or acquiring rights to code or something like that, one of the smartest things you can do today is, is some sort of due diligence on what you're bringing into the company from the standpoint of uh, other people's IP and or, you know, open source content. Yes. That, that company is being built one of mentioned for obvious reasons. Was the issue ever properly resolved to your satisfaction or their satisfaction? Yeah. The, the question was, you know, my example earlier, was it ever resolved to the best of our knowledge? And, and my point uh, on that would be, this is a this is a this is a high quality organization. Uh, their legal team was deeply involved in what was going on, so I have no doubt that. They are beginning the process of remediation, but it's a big job. Yeah, yeah it's a big job for these guys. So, do, you, do I think they've probably addressed everything and gotten it cleaned up by now? You know, likely not, because it's going to take a few revs of their software to, 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 get, to get all this stuff done. But, you know, my point is if they were smart enough and diligent enough and paranoid enough uh, uh, and prudent enough to, to uh, hire us to do this work, uh, then they are going to start the process of. The other question is like, in the way of the game, by describing what I know about Microsoft and their rules from the super lack of one who sideways and the question of Oracle because at one point the guy who runs Oracle and Bill Gates is practically operating around the job and he would play around the job and we around the whole bucket insults this one. Yeah, so, you know, look, there's always going to be pushing and shoving in the, in the, in the tech world and, and, and when it gets into the legal space it gets, it gets ugly and expensive. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons for my first comment or my first piece of advice to you, to you all is, is simply to say, if you're involved in this, um, you know, get your organization to put some kind of lightweight policy and procedure in place for your use of other people's intellectual property and abide by it. Simple enough. All right. Okay. Yes. One question. Um, you said you have a, uh, a system for documenting code. Is that like a tag-based system where it generates tags for this piece of code and tags for that piece of code? Not that sophisticated, actually. It's, it's, uh, Basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a system that allows you to say, look, I'd like to use curl, you know, at this version level, and it, you know, has a little workflow in which, you know, we, you know, the, the license is examined and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, any policies are uh, vetted for, for its use, and if you can get it automated, sure, that's fine, and the people have used it, we approve that sort of thing. So it's more of an overall thing, it's not really tags. Yeah, it's not an attempt to tag. Now, now, I will tell you that as we, one of the things that is a high priority for us in the, in the scan side 
is to allow uh, people who look at code using our tool to then tag their content findings yeah. so that whenever they look back, yeah. uh, they, I have thought a, be a good yeah, they have a documented record that makes of yeah, what, what was going on there. Okay. With that, unless there are other uh, questions or comments, I will say thanks for inviting me tonight. I hope you found our discussion interesting.